all of these are places that you can absolutely get to. So if you do the whole loop trail, it's about three miles long. And here, here's some critical information. Um, don't go to the regular um, area at the, at the state park. You know, don't head towards the campgrounds and those kinds of, of other places. You'll go past the regular park entrance and you're gonna turn off on uh, Norris Ferry to Dabney Lane. And, and then you'll kind of you know, follow um, all around. This is the all trails link. But this kind of shows you a little bit uh, where it is. So you'll actually come, here's Norris Ferry, and then this is Dabney Lane right here. So um, the, I've been to this trail several times and I actually got us lost the last time. Um, I tried to, to go there. So, um, so that's why I'm giving you the directions. It's just actually a little bit below the dam um, and the trail goes right along the Clinch River. So it is, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful little trail. And there are lots of times on Saturday mornings in the springtime, in normal spring times, when the rangers will give guided hikes um, on this, uh, on this trail. So if you like that, you know, show up at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings uh, in the springtime, but if you don't, then, you know, you can kind of work around uh, this trail. I mean, I typically see a few people when I'm here, but it's not like wildly crowded. And so here we are at, uh, at the trailhead. And so essentially this trail, you walk a little bit um, together and then it kind of breaks off. So we're going to spend most of our time on the lower loop with, um, with a little bit less time on the, the upper loop of the trail. So here's a beautiful river shot for you. Um, I look through my images and honestly I think this is the only shot of the river that I have. I get completely distracted by the flowers from here on out. So that's the Clinch River. And as we kind of uh, start early, kind of the upper part of the trail, um, I'm, you know, starting to, starting to get into it. We've got a few um, species that are starting to uh, crop out. This is of course one of, um, one of our fun favorites. Uh, this is little brown jugs and of course we get lots of um, interesting pollination mechanisms for some of these early spring flowers. Flies and thrips actually serve as pollinators here, so the very, very uh, small flower. This is one that it may take up to seven years to actually get a plant mature enough uh, to bloom. You know, we're still kind of a little bit on the upper part of the trail here. This is, um, this is a heuchera, so this is one of our native heucheras. Um, there are a couple of different subspecies of heuchera velosa, but velosa means, you know, hairy. And so uh, hairy alum root is one of its common names. And the cool thing that I always um, enjoy when I'm hiking about heuchera velosa is that some of the native uh, genetics have been moved into a lot of our cultivated species. So autumn bride, uh, caramel, if you enjoy that strong performance of those heuchera in your flower bed, then you can thank uh, Heuchera velosa, right? So, um, so beautiful in the woods, but even helping us out uh, in our flower beds. Um, we get some wild ginger um, up there at the, uh, at the top of the trail. This is actually the same family as little brown jugs, and so we see some of those kind of same characteristics, low blooming flower, really close to the ground, and, uh, and, and so here's the, the fun thing about wild ginger is that um, what it wants to attract for pollination are uh, flesh-eating flies. And so it has that uh, carrion uh, smell there. That's your, uh, that's your happy thought um, for the day. Then we see some, uh, some meta rue. This is actually early uh, meta rue. And I believe that this spot on the trail may have been the first time that I was really introduced uh, to this species. Here's an up close of the flower. And these are actually the male flowers. And, uh, and so this is uh, Philatricum uh, dioecum. And so the dio meaning that we have male and, uh, and female flowers on male and female plants. So, um, so that's pretty cool. And right here is what the female flower uh, looks like. So you can see all the, you know, the stigmas and the styles uh, there on that female flower. Um, then of course, you know, you'll see this on some other people's presentations. I won't talk forever about this, but blood root, uh, you know, here the flower is already done blooming. Um, my favorite time for this trail is trout lily time of year. And the trout lilies are a little bit later uh, than blood roots. And so sometimes I'll get lucky and I'll catch a blood root still blooming. So, uh, so here we see a bloom, but lots of times the blood roots will already be passed 
by the time we get to prime trout lily uh, season. And the same is actually true for the hepatica. Um, so there are a couple different species of hepatica, the ones with more pointed tips on their leaves and the one with more smooth tips on their leaves. Here you can see very much at the end of uh, a blooming season for this um, hepatica. So, you know, while some of those really early spring ephemerals were getting uh, late for them, we aren't quite to the beautiful fern time. So this is northern uh, maidenhair fern. I love uh, maidenhair ferns. Um, I keep trying to keep them alive in my own uh, wildflower plantings. And, um, and so you can see uh, just starting to unfurl. Uh, you know, I haven't gotten to like the, um, the heart of this trail yet, so I'm still, you know, taking pictures and entertaining myself. This is Tiarella cordifolia, um, so foam flower, one of our natives. And, uh, and when we see foam flower, we know rich, moist uh, conditions. And I could have given you a little bit of information kind of on aspect. This trail, of course, runs along the river and it's kind of facing northeast. So when we think of a northeast location, what we're thinking about are the deeper soils that northern aspects uh, can provide for us. So definitely mesic, right? Good, uh, moist soil conditions and along creek banks, this would be the kind of place where we would start to know that we're, you know, we're getting close to a foam flower range. Um, I love foam flower because um, of the pigmentation that it has on the center of its leaves. Oh, and there's a little bit that's uh, starting to bloom. And so we're starting to kind of descend uh, down into the lower parts uh, of this trail. And oh, my goodness, the trout lilies um, have started to appear. And so I should give credit where credit is due on this trail. Um, because Andy Pulte, uh, one of my colleagues here in the plant science department, is the one who, you know, three or four springs ago sent me a text and said, this weekend, like, you have got to go uh, to this trail. And, um, and so this is more trout lilies than I have ever seen uh, in my entire life. And you get to this kind of lower midpoint of the trail and you just start to, you just start to be overwhelmed. Uh, by the amount of uh, trout lilies. They are in fact a member of, you know, native member of the uh, lily family. Um, and if there may be some of you who've heard me teach, you know, botany or some other um, part of our uh, Master Gardener intern training, and you've heard me talk about trout lilies. So they're kind of a special flower for me because we have a spot on my grandmother's farm where there are like half a dozen, right? Just three or four trout lilies. And so as a kid and as an adult in the past few years, um, I always go, you know, to my grandma's farm and we make the pilgrimage over there. You have to cross the creek and, you know, it's getting more challenging because my grandmother's almost uh, 90. And right now, this week would be the trout lily blooming um, at, the, at the farm in uh, West Virginia. So I was used to half a dozen trout lilies, but I had never seen trout lilies on the scale that we have them here on the River Bluffs Trail. There are actually two different species of trout lilies. Well, there's actually four, but there are two yellow species that look uh, fairly similar, and they are the yellow trout lily and the dimpled trout lily. This is a picture that I took last spring when I was hiking with my, mo my grandmother and my aunt, and I was explaining to them the difference in the species, which you can kind of see by looking at the seed pod. So um, this is um, a yellow trout lily, or um, Erythronium americanum, and you can see that the um, the uh, style and stigma stay attached and we, you know, we kind of have a pointed uh, seed pod there. Dimpled will, you know, be dimpled there. They were not as enthusiastic about this uh, as I was. And so as you continue down this trail, um, you just start to get overwhelmed by the volume of trout lilies that are everywhere. You look up, and you're like, oh my goodness, they're all across that hillside. And then you look down and they are truly everywhere. So, um, as with many of these native ephemerals uh, that we're talking about, sometimes it takes a few years for them to get large enough to flower. So with one leaf, um, they will, uh, they, you know, they won't be big enough to bloom. And then when they get two leaves, um, they can be big enough to bloom. And you look up, oh my, more um, down along there. You can kind of see down, looking down the riverbank, just huge carpets of, uh, of leaves. <laughs> Another upward shot and you're just kind of, um, you're just in a sea that goes on for, I don't know, maybe an eighth or a quarter of a mile, but just entire hillsides, one direction and the other direction. This may be my favorite shot right here, which is you just look up 
and you just start to pick out pieces of yellow and you realize, oh my, that entire hillside is completely covered. And so usually it's about the last week of March, right around the 1st of April. Of course, you know, it varies depending upon temperature. Um, but trout lilies, their blooms will actually last for a few days. Um, they will open in, in sunlight and kind of track the sun as the day goes by. So if you are like a break of dawn hiker, you may not get quite the display that you would later in the day when all the flowers are open uh, due to sunlight. And just about the time when, you know, I can't think, I, I can't, um, I'm not sure if I can take, you know, any more amazing wildflower displays. We kind of get past the, the main trout lily area and then the Dutchman Bridges um, area starts to, um, starts to appear. And so these are one of our native dicentras. Um, there, we actually have three different native uh, dicentras here in Tennessee. This is, of course, why we call them Dutchman's britches, because they kind of look like a, a little pair of baseball pants, you know, upside down. And so these are probably the most common of the native dicentras. Um, uh, so we also have squirrel corn, which has a narrower um, bloom. And then we actually have a native uh, bleeding heart, which is a pink flower. Um, so those kind of the three uh, dicentras, and almost like it was with the trout lilies, you just kind of look up the hill and you look down the hill and everywhere uh, you see blooming Dutchman's britches. And, uh, and so sometimes they'll be a little bit earlier than the trout lilies, so it's not necessarily common to see them both peak at the same time, but it is an amazing display. And just like that hillside I showed you with trout lilies, this is a hillside just covered with Dutchman's britches. A little bit of up close there. Um, oh, of course, along the, you know, the sides of rocks. Oh, I've started to see a twin leaf there. Um, and then you get um, kind of towards the, the end of the underside of the bluff trail. We're kind of starting to turn and go up the hill. And there is a great spot for twin leaf or uh, Jeffersonia diphyla. And this, this spring, because um, we we're actually there before it closed, um, they were actually in bloom, and so I was pretty excited. I got to um, get some pictures of, um, of the twin leaf, and so there they are uh, in bloom, and then right kind of um, at the end of that trail, as you start to head up uh, the hill, we can see some uh, beautiful um, fern leaf or purple phacelia. Lots of times it's mixed in with the celandine poppy, so you have this great um, yellow and purple uh, combination. Um, now, at that part of the trail, you can either go ahead and hike the loop and go up in the drier um, upper portion of that bluff trail, or you can turn around and just go right back where you came from and, uh, and pick up more of those amazing uh, wildflowers that were on the bottom half of the trail. I kind of split back and forth. Some years, you know, I get energetic and enthusiastic and, uh, and go, get the, um, go get the upper part of the trail. And sometimes I just want to see it all again and I go back the lower part of the trail. So as if you climb the upper part of the trail, you'll see some squall roots. Um, this is actually a putty root orchid. So um, it's an orchid that has um, leaves in the, you know, in the winter, in the early part of the spring to catch light when there aren't leaves on the tree. This is actually what the bloom will look like later uh, in the summer. So, um, so this is always one of the um, fun orchid, native orchids uh, to pick out. So once you get into the White Oak Sink, um, the thing that makes it so unique to the Smokies is that they, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park does not recognize it as an official trail. Um, it is a hidden trail. It's unmarked along um, other major trails, but it is also home to um, 13 species of bats where they actually do some research on the white nose fungus. And you'll notice some resources there. Uh, and there's also a link at the very end of the slideshow that you can click on that'll take you to more information about that. There are 16 caves in, in total within the sink. And just to give you some geographical background, um, this area is close to Tuckaleechee Caverns. So some parts of that Tuckaleechee Caverns kind of juts into the, the Smokies um, in this area of White Oak Sink. There are, are four waterfalls within the sink. Um, it's a pretty easy hike, but what we're here for today are the wildflowers. And um, there are wildflowers galore within the sink. Over two dozen species exist there. 
So to, to get to the sink is pretty easy. You actually come into it to via Townsend is the quickest way. Uh, once you get to the entrance of the park, you would make a right and then advance to the Schoolhouse Gap Trailhead, which is there off of Laurel Creek Road to the right. And then from there, you just pick up the Schoolhouse Gap Trailhead and follow the trail. This actually gives you some colored markings as to, to where you need to be looking for. You'll notice how that yellow trail bears off to the left. It kind of cuts through the woods. Um, this is also a horse trail, so they've got some um, barriers up to prevent horses from being able to access this area. And here's just a step-by-step -step guide to, um, to get you to the trailhead and how to actually access the sink itself. Uh, and this just kind of serves as a reference point. This is what you'll see from the parking area. You can actually make this a loop hike. Uh, you can, um, of course, it'd be about 10 miles. You can actually come out the Chestnut Top Trail back down to the river right at the Smokies entrance uh, from Townsend if you want to spend a little bit longer on the trail that day. So the next few slides just so, show us uh, advancing into the sink from uh, the, the trailhead, from the, from the horse gate right off of the school ping, schoolhouse gap trail. And then you'll notice one of the first species that we see along the trail is the large uh, flowered trillium, which is a member of the lily family. Um, there's 17 of the 30 trillium species in Tennessee are found in this area of the Smoky. So uh, they break these into two different species, the toad shades and the wake robins. And this is the yellow trillium, also a member of the lily family. Uh, this is a native species to, to the area. It's a woodland herbaceous perennial. It's got those lemon scented blooms, which makes it very attractive um, in the springtime. And you can just see the, um, these flowers carpeting the sides of the trail going in there along with some ferns and wild geraniums. And Natalie has already talked about this one, but the foam flower, which is a member of the saxifrage family, or tiarella. Uh, the Latin just means uh, little tiara, just because of the odd shape of, of the fruit. It looks kind of like a headdress of the classical Persians or, or a turban. Next up, we have Robin's Plantain. Uh, this is a member of the Astra family. You can tell by its dainty little flower there uh, why it's a member of the Astra family. Uh, it is one of the four species of flea bane that exists in Tennessee. And the, the name is kind of unique because it gets its name from, from the Greek, airy, which means early, and geron, which means old man. Um, so this is just another name for this would be, um, even some people call it goat flower or hoary down, but it is one of the most common flea banes in Tennessee. This is a unique species to take note of. It's the wood betony. Uh, it's a member of the snapdragon family. You can kind of tell from the flowers there. Uh, there are only two species found in Tennessee. And then we have the sweet white violets. And of course, we all know that wood violets um, amass the forest floors this time of year. And I think you've heard uh, Rachel, Natalie, and myself all talk about having these at, um, at home as part of our own landscape. But this one is unique because um, it is that white bloom and you can kind of see it's the almost like a tooth uh, teardrop looking bloom. This is the erect goldenrod. It's a member of the Solidago um, family and the Astor family. Uh, we have 31 species of goldenrod throughout Tennessee. Many folks will often confuse our traditional goldenrod with ragweed in the fall and think that's what gives them hay fever, but it's actually the ragweed because the pollen on goldenrod is too sticky and can't be dispersed very easily by wind. And this is a unique flower. It's the bell wort, or also called uh, wild oats. It's a member of the lily family, and it's going to be one of the first species to bloom in the springtime. Next up, we have the dwarf crested iris, a member of the iris family, uh, which iris means rainbow. And of course, um, iris is one of the Tennessee state flowers, and we actually have nine species of these that exist in Tennessee. And then we've heard Natalie uh, seen her mention the ginger 
Uh, there is quite a large population of the ginger and the little brown jugs that exist within the white oak sink. Um, very prolific, rather large plants and blooms, so it's, it's something really cool to see that along the floor of the sink. It's a member of the birthwort family. And then may apples, uh, these are quite in abundance within the, the sink. Uh, some of the largest populations I've seen, some of the, and by largest I mean actually huge. The plants themselves are quite huge. Um, may apples are unique. They're a member of the um, barberry family, but they are toxic. The seeds and the leaves and the roots are poisonous. Um, but it's kind of cool now that uh, the fruit can actually be utilized in some of our medicinal chemotherapy drugs. Just a little snippet there. Um, as we move on into the sink, we'll start noticing uh, some of these large populations of um, lady slippers. Both the pink and the yellow exist within the sink. This one's kind of nearing its end, but the pink lady slipper, also called the moccasin flower, um, is a member of the orchid family, and we have five species of, the, species of these found in Tennessee. And the unique thing about all of these lady slippers is that they have to form a symbiotic relationship with the soil, with a fungus in the soil that's going to be crucial uh, for their sur survival. Um, and they have a low reproduction rate already, so, you know, there's concern of this plant becoming um, even extinct in the, in the near future, also due to some of the poaching that goes on. So if you're hiking in this area, um, just making a suggestion to leave those alone. Don't try to dig those up and take them home with you because number one, it's against the law, but number two, you're going to have a hard time getting these started on your own. So even if you're purchasing these from a reputable source, um, it's going to take you about six to eight years to really get these growing um, in your own personal landscape. So that's what I was talking about earlier in my own video is that I've got some of these planted, but it's going to take them a few years um, to get to this point that we're seeing here. And then uh, the most prolific um, scenes I've ever seen of the yellow um, lady slipper were in the white oak sink. So you can see from these pictures here just just a very pretty dainty little flower. You can see a little bit better from the yellow versus the pink as to why it is called the moccasin flower or the lady slipper. You can actually see that it looks like a shoe in these pictures. Uh, but these two again are a member of the orchid family. And staying with the orchids, uh, these are showy orchids. Um, they're considered by most um, hikers to be one of the prettiest orchids of them all. Uh, they're a little bit smaller in stature. They're going to bloom a little bit longer than the lady slippers and typically uh, tend to form a little bit larger colony in their environment than the lady slippers. And then we just see the forest floor here with just a rich abundance and variation of various species, the elytrillium, the phlox, the mayflower, we've got some ferns, um, maybe even some hepatica down there. So lots of different species that you're going to see as you enter into the sink. And um, once you actually get into the main portion of the sink, you'll notice this carpet of blue. And right there is even some bishop's, bishop's cap intermingled uh, with the trilliums and the flocks as well, but it, they'll just be a carpet of blue as you enter into the main portion of the sink. Very beautiful, very prolific. Okay, and one of the last species I want to talk to you about within the sink are the shooting stars, or uh, we also call these prairie pointers. Uh, they're a member of the primrose family. Dodecathion uh, media is the Latin for that because um, it does look like a shooting star and back in the pioneer days uh, settlers thought that it would point to new home sites. Uh, the genus name comes from the Greek dodeca which means 12 and then theos which means God which alludes to the fact that uh, Primrose uh, was believed to be under the care of 12 superior gods. Um, this is actually a native uh, perennial um, there are going to be sources that say this is a geographically widespread flower, but these are going to be hard to find, especially within the confines of the Smokies, unless you're willing to get off the beaten path a little bit. You're not going to be able to find these on a lot of the uh, normal wildflower walks like Porter's Creek or Ramsey Cascades. 
you're going to have to go a little bit deeper um, into the park to be able to find these uh, prolific colonies. And again, this is one of the well, this is the largest colony of these I've ever seen within White Oak Sink. Uh, they tend to grow where it's very moist. You'll see them alongside um, creek banks and areas that just, um, I guess, within the sink where it's just a very moist environment. And then the last species to talk about is fire pink. Of course, this um, is starting to bloom, I guess, in some areas of the state. We're a little bit later up here, but uh, this is one that really will cover some of those river banks. So you can actually see this coming back out of, um, off the trail as you're leaving the trail, uh, come back down to the Y there to go back toward Townsend. That entire uh, wall is covered in fire pink, that entire mountainside. So it's pretty cool to see that. And that is all I have for you in regard to uh, the white oak sink. But again, there's a couple dozen species that exist within this. Um, it's about a three mile hike. If you just go in and out from Schoolhouse Gap, you'll get to see um, many of the other species that Natalie and, and Rachel are also talking about. But probably most significant are gonna be those orchids, uh, the lady slipper and uh, the shooting stars by far. So that's all I have. So today we're going to talk about Taylor Hollow, uh, which is in Westmoreland, Tennessee, uh, Middle Tennessee, and it is a natural area. It is owned by the Nature Conservancy, managed by them. You do need to get permission to visit this area. So this is the website where you need to go to learn more about how to do that. So again, uh, just nature.org, or you can just type in Google Taylor Hollow. Um, it should pop right up. Um, but again, you can read more about the area, how to get there, there's a map, um, and then it'll also tell you how to get permission to go onto this property. So again, please respect that. Uh, please don't just show up. Please do get permission and um, be careful while you're there. Again, this is not managed by a huge park service or anything like that. Uh, so do your part to make sure that this remains an area that is beautiful for everyone to visit. We will go ahead and get started with Taylor Hollow. Um, and again, this is some beautiful photos of what you might see there. So Taylor Hollow, again, is owned by the Nature Conservancy. Um, it is, was private property gifted to them. You still have to park on private property to get there. And once you get onto that trail, you'll see this sign. So that's how you know you're in the right spot. And this area, um, the sign talks about what you might see, the significance of this area. And again, it has a map there on the bottom right. So be sure that you're following that, not getting off the trail. If you have never been on a wildflower walk with Master Gardeners, I would really encourage you to do that. If you're not a Master Gardener, I would encourage you to reach out and find a local program to get involved. And Master Gardener wildflower walks are entertaining to say the least. Um, you've probably never seen so many plant geeks get together and get so excited about seeing small little flowers in the woods. So this is what that might look like. Very exciting. Um, and again, I would encourage you to get involved. There's also a lot of different fungi on this trail, um, mushrooms, things like that. We will not be talking about those uh, today, but if you like to identify those, then I would encourage you to check out this trail, Taylor Hollow. Again, uh, we don't encourage you to take any of those from this trail. Um, that is not you know, your property, so please leave them alone they are fun to find and identify. This is wood violet and this is right as you begin this trail there's huge groupings of wood violet. Again this is the one that has the purple flower on top um, and those glossy heart-shaped leaves. This is fan club moss. Again it looks like a little fan. This is in the fern family. It does spread by spores like ferns do um, but it is called club moss. Um, so this is a very interesting one, uh, growing very close to the ground, as you can see there, very short. And um, it typically likes to stay in moist areas. Um, so you can see here, it's growing straight into that other moss. Squall root. This grows on the roots of oak trees parasitically. You can see it here. Um, it just comes straight up out of the ground. The scientific name for this um, refers to the fact that it looks like a pine cone. Um, with those scales. And it does get a little bit brownish red uh, later into the season. So I would encourage you to, if you find some squall root, go back and find it later and look how those colors change. 
trilliums. There are tons of different kinds of trilliums out there. Um, this is just one that you might see on this trail. And again, um, you know, look up and find a book that has the different identifications for different kinds of trilliums so that you can try to ID the different ones that you find on this trail. Trout lilies. I know that Natalie talked a lot about trout lilies in her presentation. Um, they were not blooming at the time that we went. So you can see here just those leaves. And it's called a trout lily because it looks like a brown trout. Um, so you can see the speckled leaves there. And on the left is what the bloom would look like. Um, again, we went about April 14th or 15th um, last year, and they were not blooming at that time. Ramp, um, which is also called wild leek, and it's in that allium family. Um, you can see here just huge, large leaves in groupings. It spreads um, in a large group. And um, you can look up more about that. Uh, we'll have more information on this in the notes, but it's a very interesting plant. Rue anemone, you can see there uh, the little three leaves and then the white flowers coming up on the top there um, on those um, small dainty little flowers. And these are really, really pretty. Um, again, uh, they're very dainty, kind of weaker stems. And um, you can see the little white flowers look uh, very similar kind of to Sweet Betsy, but they do not have those pink lines in them. Purple Facilia. See here, the bees are loving this one. This one looks really neat whenever there's a large carpet of it growing along the forest floor. Um, it does have um, some very identifiable leaves on there. So you can see down below the flowers, um, that leaf coming off and it has um, the opposite, opposite, and then one uh, terminal leaf. Here that is again. Um, it's also called fern leaf or scorpion weed. There's lots of different common names for this one. Um, it is a biennial, and again, that uh, leaves down below in those five deeply lobed se segments. Jack in the pulpit, um, on Taylor Hollow Trail, you will see there are the uh, dark purple, burgundy colored insides, and there's also the light green insides. And this Jack in the pulpit has an interesting uh, name. The reason it got this name is because it looks like a preacher in the pulpit. And you can see here how you have to open it up to see inside. And here's one that is just green. Blood root. Uh, this one got its name because it looks like it is bleeding. Uh, it does come out red uh, on the inside if you break that stem open and the root. And uh, back in, you know, a long time ago, uh, Native American Indians used this to dye clothing. Um, and they also used it as war paint things like that. So it's a very interesting name. And again, it does mean bleeding. Twin leaf, you can see here, it grows in small groupings along the trail. And um, this one comes up and it has two identical, identical parts opened up. Um, so that's what that is. And this one has an interesting name as well. Thomas Jefferson's friend, William Bartram, actually identified this one and named it after his friend, Thomas Jefferson. So Jeffersonia, uh, is the name and die and the second name there die meaning two. The only other uh, species of twin leaf occurs in Japan. So this is uh, very particular to uh, Tennessee and this area in general. And so if you find some, uh, just remember Thomas Jefferson. Hepatica. This one was named Hepa. You know, Hepa after filter or liver. They named it that uh, because they believed that it looked like the liver and um, you know a lot a long time ago they used to believe that things uh, looked like what they were used for so they used this uh, to try to help with their liver or filtering out their system and um, they would eat the root and uh, the leaf itself as well so I'm not sure if this one actually looks like a liver I don't think it does but maybe you do so HEPA meaning filter and um, Nobilis because I believed it helped uh, your, your system. Dutchman's britches. Uh, this one looks like pants, again, hanging on a line. Uh, baseball pants, maybe, because they're white. And um, here we don't have a great um, photo of this, but this is what that looked like. They were just now starting to really get into full bloom. Celandine poppy, or a wood poppy. And um, this is a really pretty one. Um, especially that time of year, the second or third week of April, they were uh, in full bloom 
and blooming everywhere. So these had really spread and take over Taylor Hollow. And um, again, just a, a gorgeous flower. Nodding trillium, this is a white nodding trillium. You can see it comes up on that pedestal on top and it does flop over. So the head nods um, in the wind, blows a little bit, nods towards the ground. And this is um, a different kind of trillium, but it turns pink as it matures. Melody already talked about that. And now on the list of plants, we will be going down into Taylor Hollow itself, into the valley towards the river. And you do have to go in between these rocks. That's where the trout grows on those steps. And um, please watch your footing at this point. It can be kind of steep. And this is what you are rewarded with after you get down that steep hill. This is a carpet of blue-eyed Marys, and these are just gorgeous. Again, that first or second, third week of April in Taylor Hollow, this is what people come for, and it is amazing. You'll see people coming down um, in between those rocks, and they just stop and stare and just <gasps> whenever they see this, because it is that exciting. It's, it's just amazing when you see this. And these are blue-eyed Marys. Um, they bloom each spring. They are an annual, uh, but they reseed heavily. And um, the species name, Verna, um, you'll see the Latin name there. And that means spring because uh, typically that's the beginning of spring when these begin blooming. There's a ton of diversity on that carpet floor uh, down there as you descend into the valley. But um, typically on the very top is where those blue-eyed Mary flowers are blooming. So you see that first, but once you start getting down in there, you'll see there's so much more blooming down below. So in this picture, you can see a lot of that diversity. As you get closer to the river itself, um, it's a smaller kind of river, but as you get closer to that river itself, you'll see Virginia bluebells. So these kind of start off a white or a pinkish color and they turn blue as they mature. And these um, were just gorgeous down there by the river and um, you are kind of walking along the trail and on the right you have all of your blue-eyed Marys, on the left you have your bluebells and then the river. So it's just amazing to be able to walk through that. Downy rattlesnake plantain. Again, you have to be looking a little bit harder to see these, but you can see here those leaves just have such a intricate pattern on them. And um, again, they kind of look like uh, maybe what a rattlesnake skin would look like. Um, they're kind of a little bit um, hairy, so when you feel them, they're uh, kind of pubescent hairs on them, a little bit sticky. Jacob's Ladder, this is also known as skunk leaf uh, because it does stink. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to not go frolicking through a field of Jacob's Ladder just because it does kind of stink uh, once you start smelling them. But they are really, really pretty, and the leaves on these are just gorgeous kind of coming up like a Solomon seal, but not quite as large uh, leaves on those. Wild ginger. The so ginger uh, on Taylor Hollow, I would say, is a little bit smaller than some of the ginger I've seen on other trails, uh, but it was everywhere. It was spread out um, along the entire trail. Larkspur. Evidently, there is an area at Taylor Hollow uh, that is known for its larkspur. And as you can see here, that ginger blooming um, or leafing out underneath the larkspur. So it's kind of underneath everything at this trail. But the larkspur has those dark purple flowers there, gorgeous blooming, um, you know, amongst everything else. And shooting stars, as you begin to get to the end of this trail, um, there's a large grouping of shooting stars. And it just looks gorgeous because you get to the end and then you see this large grouping of those white flowers. And they just look so dainty and fragile, but they're um, very necessary for uh, different kinds of bees. May apples. This is probably one of my favorites to help little kids ID just because um, they're very simple to find, easy for them to identify as they're walking along the trail and get excited about because the blooms um, are only present on the doubles. So you can see here um, on this May apple, there's a bloom present. So it's very exciting for kids to see them up ahead, run up there, find them, and see if they can find a bloom. 
flocks. You can see this here. Um, again, this one blooms all along the trail. So um, this one isn't in any um, particular order here, but this is uh, what that looks like. You can see here it has those um, five petals, of course. Uh, Fox is very identifiable. And typically on this trail, it was this pretty uh, pastel purple. See it here in the light pink color as well. And just a shout out, thank you to Ms. Linda Robertson uh, and her husband, Dr. George. Uh, they are such a great help. They know this area like the back of their hand. They are so knowledgeable and they explore this area all the time. So they know the best times to visit. And we are so thankful to them uh, for taking us and showing us and helping us learn about this area in the first place. So thank you to Ms. Linda and Dr. George for taking us there and uh, leading us on these hikes. And I, again, would just encourage you to make plans to explore your natural areas that are close to you. You don't have to drive, you know, hours and hours away. Just find something near you. Find someone that knows something. Find a book and uh, try to learn more about your wildflowers that are near you. And again, um, if you're not a master gardener, um, I would encourage you to find a program. And if you are, then find some other master gardeners that are interested in exploring with you.